Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us in this afternoon's program. We are very excited to launch the 2021 edition of Legal Writing Plain and Simple, a practical guide for law students and beginning lawyers by our beloved Rex author, attorney Arvin Antonio V. Ortiz. Let us open the program with a prayer. We would like to enjoin everyone to be in the presence of our dear Almighty Father for our opening prayer to be followed shortly by the singing of our national anthem. In respectful presence of our brothers and sisters across boundaries and faiths, let us all join in prayer and worship and gratitude and for guidance. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for the gift of life and all its joys. We thank you for today, for all its challenges, in all its splendor. We thank you for the gift of one another. O God of infinite mercy and wisdom, only in unity with your will can all our toils have true meaning. Transform us into willing and able stewards of this world and its future. Bring us together to work with understanding and compassion. As we toil and grow weary, we pray for renewed strength and resolve. As we experience pain and sorrow, let us be reminded of untold good beyond. As we see pain and suffering, let us be instruments of your peace and extensions of your loving and healing hands. As we gather here today, bless us all that our collective knowledge be tempered and guided by your wisdom. Grant us clarity of vision to see the common good amidst all distractions. Endow us with humility and purity of heart to transcend all differences and reservations. When we leave this gathering, let us be the change we seek. As we endeavor to practice what we learn, let us be the good we want to see in others. As we work for our learners and their future, let it be that your will be done. In solemn silence, let us conclude with our own personal prayer. Kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Dear partners in learning, 2021 is a big year for Rex and we are happy to be able to share this milestone with you as we continue to serve you as a new, bigger and better Rex education. 
to tell us more about Rex Education and to officially open today's event. Let us hear from Rex Education's Chief External Affairs Officer, Ms. Danda Cremelda I. Buhay. Good afternoon to all and welcome everyone. With 70 years of service and dedication, Rex now evolves from that iconic bookstore that we all know to something bigger and more significant. We are now Rex Education, a brand, a community, an advocacy, a tradition of service dedicated to inspiring every Filipino lifelong learners to advance themselves and uplift others. We have gone from just providing a learners with publishing materials to accompanying them through their lifelong journey, learning in all forms, beyond the walls of institutions, learning for delight, enlightenment, and fulfillment. True to its tradition of service, Rex Education is guided by the Educampion philosophy, which seeks to rally and empower education duty bearers. An Educampion is a champion for education who works with the best interests of the Filipino whole learners in mind. Under this philosophy, Rex Education seeks, among others, to empower duty bearers in the field of education to champion education no matter what the circumstances. It is through and because of this that we are excited to spend the rest, the next two hours with you as we come together to unveil our newest offering for the Philippine legal community. Legal writing, plain and simple, a practical guide for law students and beginning lawyers, which features the fundamentals of legal writing, right from a quick review on English grammar to writing tips for the bar examinations in its ultimate goal of enhancing our aspiring lawyers' ability in legal writing. I have the honor to present the respectable man behind this book, founder of the nascent A.V. Ortiz Law Office and a professor at the University of Mindanao College of Law. Join me in welcoming one of our newest authors, a partner in championing legal education, attorney Arvin Antonio V. Ortiz. Thank you, Miss Danda, for the kind introduction. You're welcome. I'm so flattered with the respectable gentleman. <laughs> now, before I start, uh, I'd like to greet a pleasant afternoon to our audience right now, especially to faculty and staff of the University of Mindanao, to my fellow lawyers and especially to law students who really took time away from their busy schedule to join us this afternoon. Uh, I hope you'll stay until the end of the 1,000 slides I prepared. Oh. Uh, Joe, just kidding aside. Kidding aside uh, of course, I'd like to thank uh, Rex Education for giving me this rare opportunity to join the growing roster of Rex Education's book authors. I, I couldn't believe that when I was still a, a law student, customer lang ako ng Rex Bookstore. Ngayon, I'm already one of its authors. Now, let's proceed. Uh, this session, we're going to talk about, I'm going to share with you the chapters that you will find or some of the chapters that you will find in the book. We have writing in law practice, the state of legal writing, the need to write well, good legal writing, and finally, the cardinal rules of legal writing. Now, to start off, ano bang relevance ng writing sa law practice or is it relevant at all? What role does it play in our practice or in the, in the practice of law? Sabi ni Chief Justice Lucas Berasamin uh, sa article na sinulat niya, 
entitled Writing and Writing Style. Uh, by the way, uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Bersamin was our bar chairperson when I took the bar in the bar exam in 2017. So uh, shout out also sa mga fellow 2017 bar exams. According to Chief Justice Bersamin, we lawyers exist to communicate well. So what do we communicate? Many things. Whether you're working as a private practitioner, whether you're working in a government agency or a legal consultant or in an international organization, you, commu you communicate many things. But generally, we communicate our knowledge of the law, our analysis of it, and in some cases, how the law applies to certain set of facts. Now, sabi naman ni the late Justice Antonin Scalia of the United States Supreme Court, much indeed most of the communication that lawyers engage in is written. So the bulk of our work is legal writing. Now, although we spend most of the time, lawyers spend most of the time writing, it is sadly one of the if not the most neglected subject uh, in law school. Kaya, uh, in the preface to the book, I wrote, uh, if we were to ask law students which subject in law school is important, probably only a few or no one would mention legal writing. Which is why, which is why it results in a state of legal writing. We have produced a writing style that is considered by many as legalists. Now, this one I found on Facebook. Uh, it's a meme that has been circulated, but it rings true. Although it's funny, but it's true. According to the one who created this, uh, lawyers are very interesting people. If your friend gives you a mango, he will say, I give you this mango. But if a lawyer ang tatanungin mo, how will a lawyer give a mango? A lawyer will say, I hereby give, grant, surrender, and convey unto you, my friend, the said mango with all its skin, pulp, juice for you, the said friend, to cut, bite, or hack, and swallow, or do anything incidental to are connected therewith within the terms and provisions consistent with this agreement and with all the right to dispose, throw away, keep, retain the whole or any part thereof as you may deem fit or necessary for your purpose. So that's how a lawyer, funny as it may seem, gives a mango. Now, that's why no wonder many would find legal writing archaic, legalist, circuitous, and incomprehensible. Sabi nga sa cartoon ito, when my parents don't want me to know what they're talking about, they speak in legalist. Now, there are many reasons why we produce bad legal writing. Uh, but I have identified five of them, although these are by no means scientific, there's no such study yet uh, that I can think of or that I have found. But uh, these are based primarily on my experience and the experiences of others. The first reason, of course, time constraints. Uh, lawyers are busy people. Uh, they don't have time like, like other authors. They don't have time to go over over and over again, a draft of a memorandum, of a position paper, especially if you're working as a solo practitioner. You don't have any assistant. You don't have an associate lawyer to help you. So how do you manage your time? Now, you manage it by, by spending your time on some important tasks, and that usually means less time for going over a certain draft. So 
in most cases, your draft, your first draft will be your final draft. Second reason, exposure to bad legal writing. So lawyers read troves of legal documents and these documents are not exemplars of good legal writing themselves. So if you keep on reading these documents, we think that this is the way lawyers should write and this is the, way, the only way to write. We have no other exemplars of good legal writing but these documents that we've been reading in the course of our professional practice. Third, we have our boilerplate tradition. So now, these are the templates that are usually found in legal forms books. So these this boilerplates have served generations before us so present day lawyers would think that this might serve us as well because these are effective for the lawyers of the past generation. And although the language that they contain is a bit archaic, still they found their way into modern documents because they have been handed down from one generation of lawyers to another. No wonder, in, in some documents, you will find this odd phrase here. Affiant further saith not, or however you say it, which only means affiant further says nothing. So uh, it, if I were to draft this, uh, I will delete this because if the affiant has, not, has nothing to say anymore, then you might as well stop no? rather than insert this uh, intentionally or unintentionally. Fourth, ignorance or lack of formal training. Now, lawyers do not aspire to become, or law students do not aspire to become legal luminaries or they do not aspire to win the Nobel laureate for literature but they only want to get by from day to day, meet deadlines, or they skip their grammar class. But it's hard to believe because uh, as far as I know, the Legal Education Board prescribes that for a prospective law student to enroll at a law school, the student must have at least nine units in English. And the last reason, lack of practice. So as they say, practice makes perfect. And the opposite is just as true. Lack of practice means less than perfect result. So those are the five reasons. I'm, I'm sure there are still more reasons why we produce bad legal writing. Now, why do we insist that lawyers should write well? Why the need to write well? If lawyers do not aspire to become literary giants, why is it necessary that lawyers write well? Well, number one, to write well is to communicate well. That's, again, according to Justice Antonin Scalia, who is a great writer himself. Now we know that communication involves three elements. We have the sender, the receiver, and the message. Now in, in a perfect world, communication works well if the receiver understands the message of the sender. But in an imperfect world, communication sometimes breaks down. And there are many reasons that explain why communication breaks down, but one of them is that the message itself is unclear, un it's ambiguous, or not well written. So therefore, if you want to communicate well, we have to write well. If you want our message to get across the intended audience, then we must write well. Second, language is the central tool of our trade. Now, Painters or, or visual artists, for example, use paintbrush and other medium 
to create an artwork. Or, or dancers use their body to perform. Singers use their voice to sing. But for us lawyers, what do we primarily use in our trade? It's not the dry seal for notarization. It's not the notarial book. It's not the stamp. It's not... Rather, it is language. Language is the central tool of our trade. So if, if lawyers, rather, if singers, artists, and dancers take care of their voice, of their materials, of their body in order to perform or in order to produce high quality work, then lawyers must also be fastidious in using language. Third, the quality of writing can make or break a case. Now, this is true in some instance, for example, you have what you think a winning case, all the pieces of evidence still in your favor. But when it comes down to writing, you are not able to present it clearly, making the judge or the arbiter or whoever is the decision maker to wonder what you are really trying to say, then there's a higher probability that you will lose the case. So that is why we need to write well because it can largely determine whether we make or break a case. And then lastly, the law is imbued with public interest. Now the law touches others other people's lives more directly than other disciplines. Uh, I think we can get by without knowing this molecular biology, without really understanding physics, without, uh, without comprehending the literature on chemistry. But if we do not understand the law, there are grave consequences. That is why the law presumes that we know the law Otherwise, ignorance of the law excuses no one from compliance therewith. Therefore, it is in the best interest of the public that lawyers write well and that legislators produce law that can be understood by the public. As uh, Judge Learned Hand said, the language of the law must not be foreign to the ears of those who are to obey it. Because it's weird if, or it's strange that the law is intended for the public, and yet the public doesn't understand the law. Now, when do we consider legal writing good? What are the, what are the criteria? If a legal document achieves the writer's purpose, does that make it well written? It doesn't necessarily follow that if a legal document achieves the writer's purpose, it's already well written. It only makes the document effective, but not well written. Because by contrast, there are documents that are poorly written, but they achieve the writer's purpose. For example, if, if you submit a motion for consideration that is not well written and yet the court granted the motion, it's only effective but not well written. A document or a legal document or legal writing for that matter is considered good or well written if it facilitates decision making. Now, Lawyers have different types of audience. We have our fellow lawyers, we have the, the court, the judge, we also have clients, etc. And each of these audience has different needs and expectations. But generally, this audience read a legal document because they need to extract information which can help them make decisions or which can help them decide. So whether it's a judge reading a memorandum, 
a fellow lawyer reading a comment or opposition from the op opposing lawyer or a client reading a legal opinion letter from his or her lawyer, all of them have one goal. That is to extract information that can help them decide. And for this, there are fundamental qualities, according to one uh, author in the name of Mark Osbeck, there are fundamental qualities that enable legal writing to aid decision making. Number one, sabi niya, good legal writing is clear or must be clear for it to aid the lawyer's audience in decision making. So how do we make our legal writing clear? Osbeck suggested that we follow proper grammar and punctuation. There's a school of thought that says, okay lang mali ang grammar basta naiintindihan naman ng receiver. That may be true in informal context, but in a formal context as legal writing, then we must follow proper grammar and punctuation. How does it contribute to the clarity of our writing? Now, just a review. The essence of the English language is the sentence. And a sentence is formed by combining and arranging words following proper grammar and punctuation. So the article, for example, the subject, the verb, all are governed, the way they are arranged in a sentence is governed by some grammar rules and punctuation. You cannot just put the verb ahead of the subject or in any place in the sentence, but you need to follow proper grammar and punctuation. Next. We should write in plain English because some, especially uh, beginning lawyers like me, we want to impress a client uh, or the client wants us to write a in a particular way. We want to do the bidding of the client. So we write in what we think as the way that lawyers should write full of legalese, full of uh, lawyer reasons, which uh, I will share to you later. Second fundamental quality, good legal writing is concise. Why must legal writing be concise? Because as I said, lawyers have different types of audience. And aside from uh, having different needs and expectations, this audience have very little time to pour over your written work. They are not reading a fiction book or a novel chapter by chapter. They can read uh, during bedtime, but they need to extract information as soon as possible so that they can decide as soon as possible also. That is why legal writing should be concise for the intended audience to know immediately what the lawyer is trying to say. Concision or conciseness does not only mean being brief, but being efficient. So, for example, why say it is my considered opinion when you can say, I think. Later on, I'll show you uh, under what category this it is my considered opinion for. Being concise means eliminating unnecessary words and unnecessary sentences without compromising the detail that needs to be conveyed. So it, it's not just about eliminating the words just, just to be concise, but also while you eliminate unnecessary words and necessary sentence, you are also able to convey the appropriate level of detail that needs to be conveyed. You don't compromise that. Third fundamental quality, good legal writing is engaging. So, so that your intended reader will, will finish through your written work 
you must make it engaging or legal writing must be engaging. And how do we make it engaging? Osbeck suggested this. Uh, first, you may vary the length and pattern of the sentences. So, uh, it's not just uh, composed of simple sentences, compound sentences, but a good legal writer, according to Osbeck, knows when to make the sentence short, when to make the sentence long, for as long as it is still clear and understandable. Now, cultivate an authentic voice and the writing style. Now, this is hard to, this is a tall order because the voice and the writing style needs time to be developed in the same way that a great written work needs time also to come to fruition. Now, style is, of course, particular to a person. As, as they say, the style is the man. Consider, for example, the great legal writers of our time or of the past. They follow the same grammar rules. They, they write about the same subject, which is the law, and yet they vary in style. So cultivate an authentic voice and writing style. Now tell a compelling story rather than just recite facts. And lastly, use you more appropriately. Uh, in the book, I have provided some examples on how you can make your legal writing engaging by citing actual examples of written works. Now we have come to uh, the last topic. Cardinal Rules of Legal Writing. I am sure you have encountered hundreds or, or thousands of rules about legal writing, but I have distilled them into five cardinal rules, which I think uh, worked well for me and I assume would work well for you too. And within the rule, within a rule, there are sub rules. So the five cardinal rules of legal writing are, number one, be clear and concise. Second, be literate. Third, be accurate. Fourth, be wary of legalists. And fifth, be polite. So let's go over very briefly, one by one, these cardinal rules of legal writing. Number one, be clear and concise. So that's the first rule. How do we make our legal writing clear and concise? We use short words and phrases. Again, lawyers, especially uh, those who are still beginning in the practice, are fond of imitating legal phrases or using long legal phrases or words that sound like lawyers. So instead of using those words and phrases, why not use the shorter version of them? So instead of saying accordingly, say so, at the present time, at present or now, by means of, by or with, close proximity, near, due to the fact that, ito mga paborito siguro ito ng mga lawyers, due to the fact that, uh, due to or since, during the period, during, for a period of, for, in order that, for, in order to, to, in the event of, if, interpose, no objection, don't object. Uh, instead of saying in the near future, you might want to say shortly or soon. In view of, since, is in consonance with, agree with, or follows. Subsequently, after, later, then, said, some, such, the, this, that. 
under the provision of under until such time until utilize is also one of the favorites of lawyers utilize use with reference to about another favorite this one with respect to you might want to say about or on with the exception of or except for so in the book uh, I have provided also more examples of, of words and phrases that you might want to reconsider. Another way of making our legal writing clear and concise is to keep your sentences short. For example, uh, this is the statement of a uh, former presidential spokesperson and still the chief presidential legal counsel, no? Secretary Salvador Panelo, about the firing of former PACC Commissioner Manuelito Luna. So he wrote, and I will read it, the firing of PACC Commissioner Manuelito Luna by PRRD following the former's public statement asking the NBI to investigate VP Lenny Robredo for her alleged solicitation of funds and for allegedly competing with government efforts against, uh, I think we cannot mention this one, demonstrate the, demonstrates the president's intolerance to abusive, arrogant, and incompetent government officials, apart from the corrupt ones, as well as consistent with his decisive action against errant public servants. Now, if you were to read this, you will become breathless. It's, it has only, it's only a one sentence statement, but then it has 65 words. And if you notice, the gerund firing is 35 words away from the verb demonstrates. So that's how long the sentence is. Now, how do we fix it? Here's a suggested rewrite. It's my rewrite. Admittedly, it's not the best, but I think it's far clearer than the original. So the rewrite goes, the firing of PACC Commissioner Manuelito Luna by PRRD shows that the president does not tolerate abusive, arrogant, incompetent, and corrupt government officials. Consistent with his decisive action against errant public officials, PRRD fired Commissioner Luna because the latter publicly asked the NBI to investigate VP Lely Robredo for allegedly soliciting funds and competing with the government efforts against that one. Now, the rewrite still maintains the essence of what Secretary Panelo said. But if you notice, the subject, the gerund firing, is now just seven words away from shows. And the, the verb demonstrates is replaced by the shorter verb shows. And also, the sentence is broken into two sentences. So instead of having one long sentence, we broke the sentence into two sentences. The third which unnecessarily lengthens our legal writing is this what we call throat clearing phrases. Usually they appear at the start of the sentence. It's as if you are <clears throat> clearing your throat before you say something. They introduce the sentence, but they add little or nothing at all to its substance. So what are these throat-clearing phrases that 
we lawyers are fond of using. You have uh, these are not exhaust. These are not uh, exhaustive examples, but uh, these are some of the most common examples of throat clearing phrases. Uh, it is important to note that. So if it's important, then do note already. Maybe recall that. Third, it must be taken into consideration that it must be pointed out that it is worth observing that it is beyond debate that it bears articulating that it goes without saying that it should be noted that so these are some examples of throat clearing phrases that we can dispense with. If you notice, if you delete this throat clearing phrases, your sentence will still be understandable and will still stand. Second cardinal rule is be literate. To be literate, of course, is to follow grammar rules. Again, my position is that it's okay if you don't follow, you don't strictly follow or observe grammar rules in some informal context. But in a formal context, there must be some convention that must be followed. Like in legal writing, you are submitting a formal document, for example, to the court and for the consideration of the court. So you owe it to the court to follow conventions in certain convention in grammar. This is not to show off, but to achieve, more importantly, greater clarity in writing. For example, If you were to read the sentence, the Supreme Court affirmed the decision of the Regional Trial Court, which is the, the court of last resort. Now, for us lawyers and for those who are familiar with the hierarchy of courts, we know that the court of last resort here is the Supreme Court. So the modifier or the one being modified here is the Supreme Court not the regional trial court. But for the uninitiated or for someone who doesn't know the hierarchy of courts or an ordinary reader, this might, this might be confusing. The reader might get the impression that the court of last resort is the regional trial court. And in fact, it's the Supreme Court. So the confusion could have been avoided had the writer been more mindful of the rules on misplaced modifier or entangling modifiers. In this case, it's a misplaced one. Uh, so to make it clearer, it should be rewritten. The Supreme Court, which is the court of last resort, affirm the decision of the regional trial court. So in the second sentence, the reader will understand that the court of last resort here is the Supreme Court, not the regional trial court. Second, Use words precisely. To be literate is to use words precisely. We use words because the word that we use conveys the meaning that we intend to get across. Kaya sabi ni George Orwell, the, the meaning should, dicta should dictate the choice of words and not the other way around. We don't use the word simply because we feel like using it or because the word is in vogue or because there's no other word that we can use to convey our meaning. It should be, the meaning should dictate 
the choice of our words. Now, one common, uh, although rare, uh, no, one common uh, form of using the words imprecisely is this uh, malapropism, the unintentional use of a word in place of a word with a similar sound. For example, dead of sale instead of deed of sale. Illicit a response when the proper term should be illicit a response. Quick claim for quick claim. Collaborating evidence for corroborating evidence. Interpolate the speaker for interpolate the speaker. Now, another, another word uh, that is commonly misused nowadays is the word alibi. Alibi is a particular, is a term of art in criminal law. It's a particular defense that you are not in the place or in the scene of the crime and it's impossible for you to, you are in a different place so that it's impossible for you to commit the crime. But the word alibi now is used for the word excuse. So we use the word alibi and excuse interchangeably. So instead of saying, what's your excuse? We say, what's your alibi? Although that's not the proper use of the word alibi. Third cardinal rule, be accurate. And this is best expressed in Canon 10, Rule 10.02 of the Code of Professional Responsibility. A lawyer shall not knowingly misquote or misrepresent the contents of a paper, the language of the argument of opposing counsel, or the text of a decision or authority, or knowingly cite as law a provision already rendered inoperative by repeal or amendment, or assert as a fact that which has not been proved. Fourth cardinal rule, be wary of legalese. Now, legalese is the specialized and technical language of the law, but we must disabuse ourselves from thinking that just because it is legal writing, our writing has to be legalese. Now, how do we do it? First, we must divorce doublets and triplets. Ano itong mga doublets and triplets? Usually, these are found in our contracts, agreements, and other legal forms that have been handed down through generations of lawyers. Ito yung mga cease and desist, force and effect, null and void, kind and character, made and entered into, sell, transfer, and convey. Now, why is this so? Kasi, sabi ng, mga, ng ibang mga authors, the, the using doublets and triplets has a long history and it traces as far back as the early times where the English need to use uh, or need to, to use words that have uh, French in origin, Latin in origin, and Old English. So to be precise, uh, at the risk of being repetitive, they use or they, they take words coming from different uh, origin. So that's why it results in what we now know as doublets and triplets. Second, leave lawyerisms behind. Lawyerism, lawyerisms are words that give writing a legal smell 
but they carry little or no legal substance. What are these uh, lawyerisms that are so common in legal writing? Una itong, know all men by this presence. According to Brian Garner, who is uh, an authority in legal writing, this phrase or lawyerism, as they call it, is a legalistic way of saying heads up. One time, I remember I had a client who asked me to draft a memorandum of agreement for him. When, when I deleted this phrase, I did not include this phrase, know all men by this presence. The client asked, saan na yung know all men by this presence? And the client insisted to, to put the phrase back to the MOA because uh, the client feared that uh, it might affect the validity of their stipulations. But after explaining to the client that uh, practically it means heads up or it's an old way of saying or giving notice to the people that you have entered into an agreement, the client, uh, of course, I prevailed. The client... Uh, agreed with me in the end not to include no all men by this presence in the MOA. Another one is the word witness. It must be the archaic term for witnesses. And you can also dispense this with, instead of putting witnesses, you might replace it with the words background and then in after background, you include in paragraph form your were assets or under the term recitals. Third, pursue one two. It can be replaced by the short word under. Like pursue one two, Republic Act. So instead of saying pursue one two, which is a lawyerism, you might want to say under the under Republic Act number, etc. Said lawyers use this as a substitute for the, this, or those. Like when we say said agreement, the said accused, the said decision, instead of using these words, no, the, the agreement, this decision, or those decision, decisions. And then you have such, it means of that kind. But we lawyers use this for the very one just mentioned. Such stipulation, such agreement, such accused. Finally, the last cardinal rule or of legal writing is be polite. Now, sometimes our emotion gets the better of us. We are carried away by, by the delaying tactics, for example, of our opposing counsel, by the seeming bias of some judges, by the case itself. Instead of being emotionally detached, we find ourselves being emotionally attached to the cases that we handle. And that's normal because we are just human beings you know, who think, who feel also, who, who empathize with our clients. But we must remember that we are not just our client's servant. We are first and foremost officers of the court and we have a sworn duty to the court and we owe it to the court to assist the court in the administration of justice and to serve the public. Now, so this, despite that, uh, despite how emotional are we, still we owe the court the respect it deserves. As the court said 
in Torres versus Javier through uh, retired Justice Conchita Carpio Morales, the language vehicle does not run short of expressions which are empathic but respectful, convincing but not derogatory, illuminating but not offensive. So instead of using abrasive language to push our point of view, to advance our argument, we can use respectful language. We can do so without using abrasive language or a language that is calculated to cast aspersion to the court, to our fellow lawyers, and even to the clients. So we have now come to the end of the presentation. In, in writing the book, I subscribe to the idea or of Richard C. Wybit, the author of the popular uh, pamphlet called Plain English for Lawyers. My aim is to advocate the, or to propagate the idea that good legal writing is plain English. It's not about being legalist, it's not about the lawyerisms, it's not about uh, the long winded sentences. It's about writing plain English. So thank you for listening and for staying until the end of the presentation. Uh, later on, we will have a question and answer portion. And please stay tuned no, until the end of the program. So thank you once again for listening. Thank you for the very rich presentation, Attorney Ortiz. We are very honored to receive such expert guidance, especially at a time when the study and practice of law have become more challenging. In behalf of Rex Education, allow me to congratulate you on yet another feather in your cap with the release of this book. We look forward to learning more from you through your books and lectures. Once again, congratulations, Attorney, and here's some more years of working together as stewards of legal education. Thank you, Miss Diane, and thank you, Rex Education. Thank you, Attorney. And to tell us more about what makes the book an expert guide and a resource in the study of law, we are very honored to be joined by another legal expert who can best guide us on how we can use the book for an optimum learning, especially for the upcoming bar examinations. Let us all give a warm welcome to Attorney Jess Zakael B. Espejo, Dean of University of Mindanao College of Law and author of Evidence Explained. Hi, good afternoon to all uh, who, who are present and listening right now. Uh, indeed, we're very privileged to be uh, once again no, in the cusp of uh, being able to enjoy a good new book coming from Rex Bookstore. Now, pardon me for uh, for the informality. Um, I have not prepared anything no, to to the effect na kuansya na formal siya na speech for today, but. Uh, let me just uh, break the instructions a little bit because you're you're telling me to give a testimonial about the book, which I will do, but I will also give a testimonial about the author. And uh, in the hope that uh, when I give you that testimonial about the author, uh, it would encourage you, you know, to read his work and uh, let the work help you in uh in your legal pursuit, whether as a lawyer or as a an aspiring lawyer, uh, those who want to take the bar examinations in the future. Uh, first and foremost, whenever I interview students uh, for admission to the College of Law, and if I see that they uh, possess certain inefficiencies or inadequacies in terms of writing and in terms of maybe English or grammar, I always direct them to one very classic and very important book, and that is The Essence of Style by Strunk and White. And what uh, really brought me to that book, uh, The Essence of Style by Strunk and White, is the fact that 
it actually simplifies the act of writing into basic rules. Okay, so uh, in order to construct a sentence, you have one very simple rule. Uh, in order to convey a message, you also have these very, very simple rules that you need to follow. And now I am proud to say that with the work of my former student and now current faculty member of the College of Law, uh, Attorney Arvin Antonio Ortiz, madungaga na, or I'm adding to those books that I direct uh, prospective law students to no? uh, in trying to improve their manner of writing. And that is legal writing, plain and simple. And this is the book. No? And I'm fortunate enough to have uh, a complimentary copy of this book, uh, courtesy, of course, of the author. And being the, you know, the voracious reader that I am, uh, or at least the voracious reader that I claim to be, I read the book, okay, and I realized that, you know, it's not that far from uh, what uh, I recommend to my students, which is, again, uh, the essence of style by Strunk and White. It also simplifies this book, legal writing, plain and simple, also simplifies, okay, uh, the act of legal writing for lawyers and for students, law students alike. Uh, again, as we heard from the lecture or the talk earlier by Attorney Ortiz, uh, there's actually a way to legal writing that makes it simple. You follow basic, uh, what he calls cardinal rules in legal writing that, you know, that would be very, very useful. And listening to uh, his lecture earlier, it, it uh, you know, it's kind of funny, actually, because uh, a lot of things that we do as lawyers when we prepare our contracts, when we prepare our pleadings, are actually what Attorney Ortiz precisely told us about. And that is, uh, it's something we simply inherited from our elders in the profession, and that actually frames the way that we write for the entire uh, career that we have as lawyers. Okay, And I believe that this book, our legal writing, plain and simple, is a uh, good and timely book. Again, not only for law students, but also for legal practitioners. So I highly recommend this book. Uh, and Rex Bookstore okay, is very, very correct in uh, making this book no, or publishing this book by Attorney Ortiz because I really, really find it very useful. Now, that's my testimonial for the book. Now, give, let me give a testimonial to the author. Okay. Now, uh, Attorney Ortiz was a former student of mine, as I, I told you earlier. And uh, having been a law school professor for, what, 17, 18 years already, um, I've read a lot of answers coming from law students in the examinations that I give. And <clears throat> the thing about Attorney Ortiz was that, okay, this is not uh, something that, uh, what you call that, it's not something to disparage Attorney Ortiz or, or, or something to that effect, but rather it's a testament no, to the fact that he knows what he's saying when, it talk, when you talk about legal writing. Now, even Arvin here would admit that his... Uh, answers in law school were not always correct, right? I think I think Arvin would would uh, agree with me about Agreed. that fact. Oh, okay, <laughs> but you know what? Okay, whenever I read his notebook, and I know that it is his notebook because of his handwriting, because he has a distinct handwriting as well. That even if his answers were not entirely correct, you would still be inclined to give it a good grade, even if it is not entirely correct, because of the manner by which he phrased his answers, okay? His answers will, were always uh, properly argued, wrong or right. And, of course, he actual, actually practices what he preaches. So whatever he told you about uh, what he believes are the best, uh, tools to use in so far as legal writing is concerned, he really practices that. Okay? And 
uh, I was not surprised that he got a very high grade in the bar examinations. Uh, he writes very well and, you know, he teaches students as well how to write very well. And for that, I am very, very proud of Arvid. So, gikuha na ko na siya as a member of the faculty and, in, and now he is a contributing member of our law school faculty. And he is one of those uh, faculty members that I really trust. Okay. Uh, another thing that I want to say is uh, I want to welcome uh, Attorney Ortiz to the fraternity of uh, authors of indubitably the best uh, law publisher in the country, and that is, of course, Rex Bookstore. You know? uh, in, in Mindanao, there are very, very few writers, and there are even fewer who dare to put their work out there. And for that, I salute you, Arvin, uh, for having the confidence and the know-how to write a book. Okay? So uh, it's not every day that a former law, law school professor and the dean of the law school in which he graduated can say that uh, a student of his okay, is already a published author uh, with Rex Bookstore uh, nonetheless. Okay, so uh, I'm very, very happy for this. Uh, I thank Rex Bookstore for trusting Attorney Ortiz. Uh, for me, there is no doubt that Attorney Ortiz is a uh, worthy addition to the pantheon of lawyer authors for Rex Bookstore. So uh, that's it, the testimonial that they gave for Attorney Ortiz. And I will promote this again, this book, Legal Writing, Plain and Simple, because it really makes the task of writing plain and simple. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Attorney Arvin Antonio Ortiz. Thank you Thank so you. much, Lee. All right. Thank you very much, Attorney Jess, for all these kind words. Hearing your praises of the book gives us utmost pride for having been chosen and entrusted with the publication of this masterpiece. In the same vein, allow us to express our gratitude to you as well for being stewards of legal education and of law practice yourselves. Now we're opening the floor for question and answer with our author, Attorney Ortiz. So feel free to comment your questions below. We will be selecting three questions for the comments. And as we move forward, I will be reading the questions in your behalf, Attorney. So to our audience, if you have any questions, Feel free to comment your questions on the comment section. Once again, we are now opening the floor for our question and answer with our author. So feel free to comment your questions below on the comment sections and we will be selecting three questions from the comments as we move forward. Any questions from our audience? Perhaps, Miss Dayan. Uh, yes. Yes, attorney. That, that most of the questions are addressed to Rex more to Rex than to me. <laughs> Magkano do yung book? <laughs> <laughs> All right, but attorney. Okay, so do you have um to our audience? Do you have any questions for attorney Ortiz? All 
All right, for the um, for our um, audience who are and who are asking about the book, we will be flashing a QR code later, and in there there will be instructions on how to to uh, buy and uh, and the um, prices of the book. All right, I believe, attorney, that our audience has fully understood your presentation since there are no further questions and clarifications. Uh, I think Sam, there's a question here. All right, so. Uh, I, I'll read it myself. Mala. All right, go ahead, attorney. Uh, the question goes, what were your struggles while well, you were writing the book and how were you able to overcome them? from uh, Pep Dillera. Is it Dillera or Dillera? Anyway, uh, thank you, Pep Dillera, for the questions. Now, the first question, what were your struggles? I think uh, it, it's not par particular to me. I think all writers experience this. Uh, the main struggle is, of course, writer's block. Uh, there are times that uh, the words just don't seem to come out and uh, it's hard to continue writing, especially uh, although we cannot mention it, whether we like it or not. I wrote the manuscript of the book in 2020 and uh, as we all know, 2020 was not a good year for most of us and there's a, there's a fear there's, a, there's too much worry about what would be our lives after the, the event. Huh? I'm afraid to mention it, <laughs> as has been warned. But <clears throat> how were I able to overcome them? Or how were I able to overcome writer's block? Well, uh, in the beginning, I prepared an outline. And I broke down the task. Writing a book is a gargantuan task. No? It's a Herculean task, to say the least. But instead of thinking it as such, I, I broke down the task into small tasks. And I committed to complete a task every day you know, during the time that I was only staying at home, doing nothing. So uh, that's it. That's how I overcame writer's block. I committed to the task of writing every day, producing at least uh, a page or two or even a chapter of the book until the time that I finished writing the manuscript. So uh, I hope I answered your questions, Step. Thank you. Thank you very much, attorney. Is there any more questions from our audience? Feel free to write your comments in the comment section. Any more questions? All right, attorney, I believe that there are no more further questions and clarifications. So is there anything else you want to say before we end the program? Uh, aside from thanking Lex Education again, uh, I would also like to thank My students no, at the University of Mindanao College of Law, for whom uh, most of these ideas were first tested and shared, and to, uh, to my family, especially my mother and brother, my sisters who are watching, and to my fiancé. 
for the constant support. So I guess that's all. All right, thank you very much, attorney. Attorney, we 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 have um we, we still have one question. Is it okay if I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, so do you have any plans of writing another book to help us become good lawyers? From Miss Zara Prang. Do I have plans of writing another book to help you become good lawyers? Uh, for everybody's information, Zara is my current student at no, the university. Right now, uh, no, uh, I'm still, I'm still thinking about it, but uh, I have no particular plan yet to write another book. Perhaps uh, some recommendations. No on what books to read to help you become good lawyers. You buy the book. <laughs> Legal writing, plain and simple. All right. Thank you very much, attorney. All right. At this point, we will now listen to Rex Education's General Manager for CLV Law, Mr. Reginald Soriano, for his word of thanks. Um, a pleasant good afternoon, uh, Ms. Tanda Buhain, our Chief External Affairs Officer, uh, Dean Jess Espejo. Um, good afternoon as well. Distinguished guests, faculty, law students, law practitioners. Uh, we are here because we are happy to be a partner to a great endeavor, a book that will definitely help our law learners and even practitioners as they try to better themselves, uh, improving themselves and becoming better communicators. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to extend our deepest and most heartfelt gratitude and thanks to attorney Arvin Ortiz. Sir, maraming maraming salamat po for being part of the Rex family. We are truly happy and grateful that you are part of our family now. And we are looking forward to being able to create more learning solutions that will help our law learners and our practitioners. And siguro, just to put everything into perspective as we close this event, we'd like I would like to share with you a simple uh, a memory that I've had in terms of growing up, uh, learning, as a student of anthropology. Um, one of the things that we learned was that when we talked about ancient writing and things that we try to understand how the human race struggled and become become where it is right now, one of the things that we saw po natin dito is the fact that the oldest ancient writing that we can see is the cuneiform writing. In the cuneiform writing, the way they created that, the one that has survived all through these years in those clay tablets, is actually a legal contract, transactions between parties documenting what was traded, what was provided, and what was given. So from an anthropological perspective, it's great to understand and see that writing is a way of communicating and it's elevated us in terms of how we're able to advance our civilizations. But if you take it into the perspective of what Attorney Ortiz has mentioned in his book and has cascaded today, I think it's very relevant to note that even from the beginning, when we wanted to codify, when we wanted to talk about things, when we wanted to justify and provide a society that is just, fair, writing was the way and the means for us to document that. So it's very, very important that when we write things, when we put words to paper as they speak, it is about fairness, it's about just. So again, we are so grateful and thankful that this tool that Attorney Ortiz has provided for us will help and improve our law learners so that they become agents to ensure that justice is carried out and more importantly, learning moves forward. So in behalf of the Rex Education family, maraming maraming salamat po. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Reggie. On that note, 
we have come to the end of this afternoon's program. Indeed, it was a very productive learning afternoon with our legal luminary, Attorney Ortiz, and our distinguished guests from the field of law. In behalf of Rex Education, I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude for having been chosen as your partner in legal education. We look forward to more years of our fruitful partnership as we continue to work together to enable law students and lawyers achieve their dreams of becoming lawyers and excelling as one. To everyone who joined us this afternoon, thank you for learning with us and for choosing Rex to be your partner in learning. See you all on our next book launch and lecture. Thank you and keep soaring, Edo Campions.